And now um, I'm, I will invite the next speaker. And this is uh, our only speaker who presents business. And at Uppsala Health Summit, we believe that gathering uh, those different actors that we are here today, researchers, uh, policymakers, uh, business, as well as civil society, and to have conversations together is the way forward. So therefore, I'm very glad to welcome Marie Chantal, uh, Marie Chantal Messier, who is Global Head of Food and Industry Affairs at Nestle. And Marie Chantal has previously worked at both World Bank and World Food Programme, and she might also tell us a little bit about this transition. And you will speak, uh, give us a private sector perspective on transforming food systems that are good for people and the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a bit difficult to come after such an interesting uh, presentation, um, but first and foremost, I want to thank the organizers for inviting the private sector to be there. Uh, I'm very grateful um, also because today I heard many of you say we need more collaboration, we need more dialogue, we need to understand different perspectives. And so um, this is why I really want to thank the organizer for allowing me to present uh, the Nestle perspective, because this is the company I know the most. Uh, I won't uh, pretend that this is the whole private sector, but um, let me tell you also a little bit about me. Uh, as as uh, Louise said, uh, I worked 15 years in, as a public health nutritionist. Uh, I worked for the World Bank. I worked for the United Nations uh, World Food Program. Uh, I worked for GAIN, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. And then after 15 years, um, I was given the opportunity, Nestle invited me to join them to be a positive agent, internal agent of change, uh, basically to drive more responsible um, marketing practices in the company. And so I thought, um, this is, wow, this is a challenge. This is a real challenge for a public health nutritionist. How can I use the largest food and beverage company in the world to drive what I like the most, which is put nutritious food in the mouth of people that need it? So, voila. So I'm just wanting to tell you a little bit of, um, I am a public health nutritionist who works for the private sector. Um, and how does that translate into uh, how the private sector drives food system transformation. So, um, ha, this is what I was looking for. Um, the presentation is called uh, Generation Regeneration. Uh, why is that? This is a journey on which we have embarked and also about the right incentives. Um, uh, uh, Professor Sunstein was talking about incentives um, and what are the incentives that drive the private sector to invest in transforming in the regenerative food system. Um, let me start with one of my uh, favorite uh, quote uh, from the book of uh, Jess Manzo. Uh, Without healthy humans, there can't be a healthy planet. And with poor planet, there, can't, there will be poor human health. And I think this is where the real intersection, and this is where also food and beverage companies can really drive change, is addressing throughout uh, the value chain how you can interact to drive health. Let me talk to you a little bit about Nestle. Um, for those of you who might not know much more than um, yesterday was interesting. Uh, I sat at the, uh, at the uh, dinner and the person said, oh, that's nice. My parents used to boycott your company. So for those of you who only know the boycott about Nestle, let me tell you a little bit about the company as well. Um, so we have a, a, a purpose that we have enhanced uh, two years ago to unlock the power of food to enhance the quality of life for everyone, so sustainable food for all, today and for generations to come. And this is very important, the generations to come, because Nestle is a company that um, is 155 years old. And when you work in a, Nestle, in a company like Nestle, they tell you right from the start, we've been here for 150 years and we invest to stay in business for the next 150 years. And so Louise was asking me earlier, um, what's the difference between working at the World Bank and working in the private sector? There's a lot of it that comes to time frame. At the World Bank, I was working on changing the world 
uh, project by project that were three to five years time frame. At Nestle, it's 150 years time frame. So this is what, why we invest in transforming the food system. Um, also, uh, we work in 186 countries in the world. So our global footprint, so my drive to be able to put positive change at scale is a possibility through, through that company. And then we have about 2,000 products, and it ranges, from, uh, it ranges from very affordable products, such as fortified Maggi cubes, all the way to personalized and medical uh, nutrition um, that we use for people with uh, nutrition pathologies. Also last year, this is when we, as I said, we launched Generation Regeneration. So with the purpose, we also had our sustainability promise. And this was to advance regenerative food system at scale. Every word counts in, in, this, um, in this statement. Regeneration, we talked a lot about in the, in the morning of sustainable food systems, um, affordable for all, but we haven't really talked about regenerative. Actually, uh, earlier this afternoon, someone said, that's a fuzzy word, what does that really mean? It really means actually leaving the planet better than how you found it. So that's what we're driving for. And as I said, we have a global footprint, so we can actually drive it at scale. And what's our definition of regeneration? Three words, it's we help to protect, renew, and restore. Because we realize that with the way that we have been using, not when I say we as Nestle, but um, all of us, uh, we need to restore our food system, so we leave it in a better shape than we found it when we were born. We are on a journey. We don't have a silver bullet. We're not the only one in this. So we are taking small steps, uh, but solid steps towards regeneration. So we work on three, um, basically three aspects. We work first on the environment. And this is super important. As I said, we help protect, renew, and restore our environment through regenerative practices. So we are investing with farmers for a just transition towards regenerative food systems. Because we have to realize that asking them to change the way they basically do business, they farm um, to do regeneration, has some risk and has some challenges, and so we're helping them to de-risk moving towards a regenerative farming techniques. We also help communities, and I'll give you more examples uh, on the next slide. Uh, we help to improve the livelihoods. We invest in people well-being in the supply chain, their resilience um, all over the world, particularly in the farming communities, but also our 300,000 employees. And then last but not least, this is my favorite, uh, as you will uh, uh, notice, uh, we provide more access to nutritious food um, to billions of people, and we also focus quite a lot on affordability. This is a big driver for us, particularly with the food price inflation that we're seeing. We have a big conscience. Um, we're focusing on making sure that our food can remain as affordable as possible. So, um, who do our work protects? And I think this is also a different perspective from what we have heard this morning, is we take a value chain approach. So everybody, um, I know we're not supposed to say from farm to fork, uh, but everybody around how can we support them? And I think this is important of, of looking at um, the health of everyone across the value chain. So we look at the farmers, we help to protect the workers in our supply chain, particularly at farm level, uh, with good human rights, good practices uh, in the communities, in the supply chain. So we invest quite a bit at supporting women farmer, particularly how can they get financing uh, and how can they uh, get also the land that, uh, that, they, can, that they, they need to farm. 
protecting children. Uh, we're investing quite a bit in this uh, cocoa supply chain uh, so that uh, children can go to school and children are kept off the farm uh, and sent to school. Uh, our employees and site contractors, so we have quite a few uh, programs, actually in every office, we have a program to support healthy eating and well-being and, and health of the employees. So uh, we have a program called Know Your Numbers. And then last but not least, because this is basically who choose our products, is the consumers. So how can we drive health of the consumers and how can we help them uh, consume a balanced diet? What's the sustainability journey? So we've started with net zero. Um, what's net zero is basically that by 2050, we will have uh, no carbon emission. Um, we actually, the good news is, so you'll say, oh, well, that's far. Um, the, we were talking about timely in the previous presentation. It's time, uh, is that far? Um, but it's important to, to set those ambitions. And actually, we're quite happy because last year, this is where Nestle has reached peak, tar uh, tar um, peak carbon emission. And now we're actually going down. So it's important to set those targets and work towards them um, uh, slowly but surely. Uh, we also have a uh, program. So right after, we, uh, we have a uh, forest positive. So what we're doing, and so I was working in Africa until last year uh, for Nestle, and uh, we're actually investing to reforest, uh, particularly in the cocoa uh, sector. So planting trees so that, and, and it's good, it's well, how does it transform? It's not just about uh, corporate social responsibility. We sign a chat, we plan, uh, we plan that. But it makes sense, actually, to have this forest positive. Why? Because we actually can see an increase in, um, in, in, uh, in yields and also mitigate the impact of climate change. And why is climate change so important for us is because this is the greatest risk that we see to the production of food. So it's very important that we invest in climate and in health because this is a big business risk. So as I talked earlier, we have uh, a big program to invest in uh, regenerative agriculture that we've launched. Um, we have a human rights framework that we have. So how do we protect the human rights of workers? Uh, during the pandemic, there was a lot of discussion about how, um, how we can support workers and protect their human rights. Um, Last year, we launched a, uh, what we call an income accelerator program in the cocoa sector. Why? Um, because what we want is to actually encourage cocoa producers to protect their environment, adopt regenerative uh, practices, but also protect women and protect children. As I said, putting them in school, making sure they have a good education. Um, last month, um, we invested, we announced the Lesca, Nescafe plan. It's a $1 billion investment to basically uh, in the coffee sector. Um, when I was in Cote d'Ivoire, I realized that um, actually coffee production uh, is being severely impacted by climate change. We're a big coffee company, and so if we don't invest in mitigating the risk of climate change on coffee. There won't be coffee uh, for us. And so for me in the morning, this is quite important, but also as a company to provide. So it's, it's, we have decided to invest $1 billion to make sure that um, coffee production is sustainable and regenerative. And then last but not least, again, this is what excites me the most as a nutritionist. Uh, we will, in the next few months, you will, uh, you will see that. Keep, please, um, please keep posted. We will have, um, there are new rounds of nutrition commitments that are coming up. Um, and so in the past year or so, uh, I've had the pleasure to be as part of a team who is leading our new approach to nutrition. And so this is coming up. Um, this is my own slide. Um, I think 
to truly to truly transform, we need to com to collaborate beyond our comfort zone. And this would be if you have one thing that I would like you to uh, to keep out of this presentation is how can we collaborate together, the public sector, the private sector, the UN, um, beyond our comfort zone? Because what I find is that with social media, we're constantly sent back information that pleases us, that we like. And so when we interact with another um, group that might have a different perspective, such as the perspective that I'm presenting today, it makes a it makes us uh, increasingly uncomfortable, unfortunately. And so let me present you a little bit of what we can do to collaborate beyond our comfort zone. Innovation, innovate, innovate, innovate. Uh, we're the, um, Nestle is the, the largest uh, investor in uh, R&D of the food and beverage industry. Um, but innovate, why? Because the expectations of everyone has changed tremendously. Um, and first and foremost, what uh, we haven't talked about today, we've talked about a lot about behavior change, driving people, but what I really appreciated about the previous presentation was the F, fun. Why? Because the first driver of purchase of people is taste. The second one is price. The third one is convenience. Fourth, nutrition. As a nutritionist, it breaks my heart. But as someone working in the private sector, I need to realize that. Because if I want people to eat nutritious food, it has, the taste has to be there. The price point has to be there. Because it can be nutritious. We've had this experience in the UK where we've put a really nutritious um, uh, kind of a candy bar. Um, but no one wanted a healthy candy bar. So um, it, it didn't fly with consumers. So those are perspectives that I would like to, to bring to you. Um, also, the cultural context. It's very important. One thing that we do is that we have, um, we source and we produce most of our food locally. And this is important because then this is how you can adapt to the needs and the taste of, of the people in their cultural context. And then one thing that is increasingly complex for us is how do you bring in the sustainability aspect? So carbon footprint of dairy, um, plastic, packaging. How do you keep your food safe but not use plastic? And it's not as easy, particularly uh, in, in countries that are uh, quite humid and hot. How do you keep your food safe um, in, in that context? Uh, and then, of course, water. Um, one thing that is very interesting for me is how do we connect the dots? So when I look at my colleagues uh, who work on regenerative food systems, um, I think they've pretty much sorted it out in terms of the environment and farming, what we need to do. Um, they've pretty much sorted it out on packaging. Um, I think on human rights, they, you know, with the human rights framework, we're pretty much there. What we haven't sorted out is the consumer. And, and how, um, how do we bring people together to bring the consumer aspect in it? And how do we connect all these aspects together and loop in, which is my third box, um, take the consumer along? And this is challenging. It's probably the most challenging one. Um, he, uh, so uh, Professor Sunstein was, was talking about the conducive environment, make the choice easy. I think this is the perspective that we need to take out of this uh, afternoon session. How do we, how do we um, maybe a bit less of telling people what to do and putting our heads together to make it easy for people to do the right choice and the healthy choice. Um, the way they buy food the way they consume the food, because that's important. Um, I, I, there is evidence that shows that, yes, sugar tax work um, in reducing consumption of sugar-sweetened beverage, but what they've noticed is that sometimes, uh, a lot of times, actually, people would add sugar elsewhere. So in terms of driving um, sugar, we've seen that with salt also. You can have a product that is less salty, but if people put salt back on the table, how do you drive um, the change? 
Um, and then, of course, the responsible practices. How do you create the, con the responsible practices? Um, marketing to children, uh, portion guidance, uh, portion control. Maybe you can offer smaller portions. We've seen that with behavior uh, studies, that if you offer a small portion versus a large portion, people will finish their plate no matter what, and then the extra calories just pile on. And then one of the things that um, also that I'm really starting to think about is food waste. How can we take along the consumer to reduce food waste and reuse the food um, and consume, consume what's the right portion? Last but not least, and I know that this will be a little bit uh, um, uh, controversial, reward positive practices. So it's very good to have the baton and say, you food industry, you're bad, bad, bad. But when the food industry changes, when it wears the tap in the back, so I just would like you to leave, leave you with that, reward companies for focusing on social values, public health, and environmental sustainability. Actually, uh, this is, I'm, I'm going to cite the quote, um, this is Marion Nessel who wrote that in their latest blog about access to nutrition index uh, in the US. Um, one thing also, help them decide what is a good practice. So I would strongly encourage all of us to put our heads together and develop ESG metrics and nutrition for nutrition. This doesn't exist at the moment. It exists for social, they exist for environment, they exist for, government, for governance, but they don't yet exist for nutrition. And then um, move the goalposts incrementally. I was asked recently, um, why, do you lob why do you industry lobby against regulation? And my answer was, we don't lobby against regulation when they're done incrementally. Um, and so what I would suggest is celebrate the small step, move the goalpost that is achievable, realistic, when this is achieved, tap in the back, move it. But this is when I would say, um, there's a lot of people who are doing policies now. Um, I would say, continue, keep, keep your eye on the ball, um, definitely, but do it incrementally to bring everybody along with you. And so all that to say, um, thank you. We will continue to keep our eyes on the ball. We will continue to do food that is good for people and good for the planet. Um, we will continue to focus on making them nutritious and affordable. This is not easy. As I said, we need to take texture, we need to take price, we need to take um, accessibility, sustainability into that. Um, we are fully dedicated to advance regenerative food system and scales. This is a journey. We don't have all the solutions, so please help us um, get there. And then um, I will leave you with that, which is we need a wider industry effort. We hope that other industry uh, will join us. And so um, for those of you who doubt that regulation uh, to level the playing field, we are uh, in favor of that. Please do help and collaboration. Please do collaborate and let's all join hands for regenerative food systems. So thank you. Thank you so much, Marie Chantal. And